Good morning, church family, and those of you who are watching across the internet, we're glad that you could join us for today's message, which is entitled, The Lost Son. The Lost Son. And our main text comes from Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. Now, with the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus reaches the climax of his response to the charge against him by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, what was their accusation? Well, it was this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus' response is to tell them a three-part parable in which he illustrates God the Father's great love for the lost. Today, we will study the third part of that parable. Richard Trench, in his book entitled Notes on the Parables, has called the parable of the prodigal son the pearl and crown of all the parables. And so we see that this is the greatest and most precious of the parables. It is the most tender and touching story ever to come from the mouth of our Lord. This parable has often been called the gospel within the gospel. Now the term prodigal is a word that we don't use much anymore. It means wasteful, reckless, uncontrolled, or excessive. And while this parable is traditionally called the prodigal son, it can rightfully be called the parable of the loving or compassionate father, as it reveals more about the love of the father than the sinfulness of the younger son. But the parable also reveals much about the heart of the unforgiving brother, the the oldest son whose purpose in this parable is to rebuke those who are unwilling to reach out and to receive those who repent. Now, even though I have entitled the message, The Lost Son, it has more to do with the loving father than with the lost son. British preacher and teacher George Campbell Morgan wrote, By referring to this as a parable of the prodigal son, we lay emphasis on the wrong point, the wrong word, at the wrong place. The true emphasis is not on the boy, but on the father. It is an unveiling of the heart of God, and in all that it is intended to teach, there is no more remarkable or beautiful passage in the scriptures of truth. It is a revelation of the infinite grace and tenderness of the Father's heart. So with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we can study your word this morning. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We celebrate his birth this month, and And we know that he is the reason that we celebrate. Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus into this world to fulfill your purpose by going to the cross and giving his life so that man can be redeemed and saved from his sins. Father, we thank you that we are reconciled back into a right relationship with you through your son Jesus and his death and resurrection. Father, I pray that as we study your word today, that we would receive your message into our hearts and our minds, that our heart, our mind, our eyes, and our ears would be open to your word, that we would live it out through our lives. Father, help us to have that same compassion and love for the lost that you have, And help us to welcome them with open arms and to show love 
and forgiveness to them when they repent of their sins. Father, help us to seek those who are lost, that through the love of Christ, they may, be, they may come to repentance. Father, I pray that you be with me as I preach your word. Help me to communicate it clearly and effectively as I should for your glory. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's begin our study this morning by turning our Bibles to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a, a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours or was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, I want us to take a closer look at this younger son's departure from home, his departure from home. And this covers verses 11 through the first part of verse 13. Now, 
we see that the younger son asks his father to give him his portion of the inheritance that he's due. Now, according to the law of Moses, the older son would receive a double portion of the inheritance. According to Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, it says, he must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double share of all he has. That son is the first sign in his father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. Now, since there was two sons, the younger son would receive one third. And like many impatient young people today, the younger son desired to be freed from parental restraints. He desired to have his father's inheritance now instead of waiting until he dies. And so his request was disrespectful to the father as it was essentially saying, I can't wait until you die. Or I wish you were dead. How disrespectful. And as soon as the village discovers the outrage of asking for his inheritance, they will most likely perform a ceremony that would excommunicate him from village life. And in essence, they would consider him as though he were dead, which makes sense to the words that his fathers will use saying he was dead and is alive again. Well, instead of being angry with the son, the father grants him his request anyway. And the younger son soon takes all that he has to a distant country. So let's look at his life abroad, his life abroad. And this covers the second part of verse 13 through verse 19. So we soon see that this young boy lives a prodigal or a wasteful, extravagant lifestyle. And he soon depletes his possessions. Now his poverty is complicated by a famine that strikes the whole country. And in desperation, he hires himself out to a man to feed pigs. Now, this would be most degrading to a Jew, for pigs were considered unclean. According to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7, Leviticus 11, verse 7, it says, And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. And so this son is working and he's giving the pigs the leftover food scraps. And his hunger is increasing. And as his belly gurgles, he desires to eat some of the pods that the pigs were eating. Now that's an act of desperation to want to eat the same thing that the pigs are eating. To want to get down into the muck in the mire, the mud, and to just eat the slop right along with the pigs. But with great hunger, he would have gladly eaten what was given to the pigs. And at some point, he finally comes to his senses, recalling how well fed his father's hired men were, that they had plenty of food. And here he was, starving to death. They had plenty. And here he was, down in the mud, wallowing with the pigs, wanting to eat the very pods that they were eating, starving to death. And so to his hunger and his humiliation was added his homesickness. And so he resolves to return home and he rehearses the speech that he will give to his father in hopes that his father will take pity on him and make him like one of his hired men. 
Well, his repentant speech confesses his sin against heaven. In other words, against God's will. And it was in God's word that in the Ten Commandments that we are to honor our father and mother. And he was sinning against his father. It confesses his unworthiness to be called his father's son. And it begs for him to be made like one of his father's hired servants. Well, let's look a little closer at his return home. This covers the rest of the parable in verses 20 through 32. Now, in these verses, we witness how the prodigal son is warmly welcomed by his father. Now, while he is still a great way away, the father sees him. And I believe that he has been looking for his son. He has been searching for his son every day, looking and waiting for his son to appear over the horizon. The father's great love is evident here. He has compassion for him. He has compassion. Now, it would have been so easy to hold a grudge against this son. It would have been so easy to yell at him and tell him that he was worthless and no good, that, that he was not welcome there and that he was dead to him. But he has compassion for him. And he runs to greet his son. Now, this was considered a very undignified and humiliating thing for a wealthy and prosperous man to do. And he would have had to take his robes and, and pull them up, showing off his ankles as he was running to meet his son. And that would have been the unthinkable. That was very humiliating and, and undignified of a man back in those days. But he did the unthinkable. He didn't care whether it was undignified. He didn't care whether he was going to be humiliated in public. But he ran to his son. And he throws his arms around his son's neck or around his body, his torso. And oh, the warm embrace of a loving and forgiving father. This boy is in rags. He probably smells of, of the pigs and and it's probably covered in dry mud. It's unpleasant. It's undesirable. It smells. It's repulsive. It's unclean. And, it, and you don't want to be around it. You don't want to draw near to it. But yet, this father draws him near to him. He brings him close and embraces him. And he kisses him. This is a sign of total acceptance. And it's something that we usually think of coming from a mother, not from a man of status. Well, this son quickly confesses his sin. He gives him the rehearsed speech and his unworthiness to be called his son. But before he can say, Make me like one of your hired men. The father joyfully calls upon his servants to bring out the best robe and put it on him, to put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. We see that the father gave the son three gifts. We, that's unheard of. Why would he reward this wayward child with gifts? But these gifts all have meaning and give insight into the gifts given to the children of God when God receives them as his child. Well, the significance of the robe is that it is a covering. It's a covering. Now, Adam and Eve lived a carefree life in the Garden of Eden before sin. And they did so completely naked and they felt no shame. Now, there was no shame because 
There was no understanding of right, wrong, or not living up to an expectation of what they should be. All they had done is listen to God and obey to him. But once they sinned by not obeying God, one that we've all committed, they realized their nakedness and tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves. The leaves hid their nakedness. And so God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve, and he clothed them, which required the sacrifice of an animal to provide that garment. And so we see that death had to take place to cover their shame, to cover their nakedness, which is often a symbol of sinfulness. Well, the robe given to the Son represented the salvation received from Christ. It is His righteousness. It is His perfection that covers our sins. And we're no longer subjects of guilt and shame. Because we accept Christ as our Savior, He does just that. He saves us from ourselves. Now, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 61, verse 10b, Isaiah 61, verse 10b, For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, and arrayed or clothed or covered me in a robe of righteousness. And so we can be clothed with the righteousness of Christ when we place our faith and trust in him. Now, God says in Isaiah 44, verse 22, in the English Standard Version, Isaiah 44, verse 22, says, I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Now, the Apostle Paul echoes this imagery in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin or to be, be a sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When we trust in Christ, we make an exchange our sins for his righteousness. And God brings us back to himself through the process of reconciliation by blotting out our sins and making us righteous. And so when we are clothed in Christ, when we put on Christ, it is his robe of righteousness that covers us. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees the sin and the guilt, but he sees the righteousness of Christ and considers us righteous. Well, the second gift of the younger son that he received was a ring. And the ring was a symbol of identity. Now, often a signet ring would be used to mark a document as having been written by the one owning the ring. Now, when we come to Christ, we do receive an identity. We are no longer children of flesh and blood, but children of God. And that is through the gift of the Holy Spirit that connects us to him. Now, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, out of the English Standard Version. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When we are baptized into Christ, the old sinful life is dead and buried. 
and we rise out of the waters of baptism as a new creation with a new identity and in a new life. The Apostle John said in John chapter 1, verse 12, John 1, verse 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so all those who welcome Jesus as Lord of their lives and are obedient to be baptized into Christ are reborn spiritually, receiving new life from God. And through faith in Christ, this new birth changes us from the inside out, rearranging our attitudes, desires, motives, and behaviors. Now, Paul declares in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so when we become Christians, we gain all the privileges and responsibilities of a child in God's family. And even when we may not feel like we are God's children, the indwelling Holy Spirit reminds us of who we are and encourages us with God's love. Now, the third gift that this son received was he was given sandals for his feet. Now, to understand the meaning of the sandals, we have to go back to verse 15. Now, the King James says, the prodigal son joined himself to a citizen of that country. Now, to join himself can have the meaning of being hired out, but is more accurately meant to be taken into slavery. He indentured himself to serve this citizen. And once a slave, the sandals would be taken away from him to prevent him from running away. You see, when we are living without God, we are slaves. And you may ask, why? Well, because you truly have no freedom found without Him. Living without Christ as your Savior means that you are living on your own terms and according to your own merits and under the condemnation that you bring upon yourself through sin. And so there is no freedom in following in sin. See, that road only leads to death. In Romans 6, verse 23, Romans 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, you have no way to free yourself from the bondage of sin, which leads to death. But when Christ comes, when you accept him as your savior, his righteousness becomes your righteousness in the sight of God. You become an heir to all that Christ owns as a child of God. So you're not just a slave being taken care of. You are a child of God. In John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36, John 8, 34 through 36, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now there's one more thing about these sandals. Do you know why the child of God can wear sandals? Well, it's because once you have found Christ and you understand the joy that comes through knowing him, there is no struggle, no war of wills, 
no shame, no guilt, no condemnation. There is love without condemnation. And you're content to stay with him, to live in that love and not run away. Well, after bestowing these three gifts, the father kills the fatted calf and celebrates his son's return. Now, all these things serve to reinstate the son as a person of importance and authority. Now, notice how the father reinstated the son by saying, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The transformation that takes place when we have been reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ is that we go from being dead in sin to be made new in a new life in Christ. You see, we are dead in our sins, but Christ gives us new life in Him. We are lost and far away from God because of our sins, but God who sought us has found us and He has drawn us into a right relationship with Him again. While the father and his servants welcomed and celebrated his return, he was jealously rejected by his brother. The older son, returning from the field, wonders about the celebration, what it's all about. And when told by one of the servants, he angrily refused to go in. So the father comes out and he pleads with him. And so the older son complains that for many years he has served his father, never disobeyed his will. And the father has never even provided him such a celebration. But now when this younger son who squandered his father's inheritance with prostitutes comes home, he kills the fattened calf for him. You didn't do it for me, but you did it for him. You can just feel the jealousy. What's so easy for us to feel sympathy for the older brother. We may think in our minds that here's a guy who represents what a good Christian should be. He's faithful, obedient, and loyal. And in our own lives, we may feel like we are that older brother. And we're saying, Lord, I've been living my life for many years trying to please you and trying to do all the right things. And I'm going through so much hardship. But this person over there has been living a sinful life and he's been rebellious. And yet he seems to be being blessed. It's not fair. Why him and not me? I'm the good son. He's the bad son. You see, we can become jealous of others when they seem to prosper, and that causes us to become resentful toward God. We forget about how he provided for us, how he protected us, and how he loves us. But here's the plot twist. The older son is not the good son and the prodigal son, the bad son. No, we see here that there are two lost sons, not just one. You see, the oldest son represents those who work hard for the Lord, but they've neglected their relationship with the Lord. This older son has spent most of his time in the field working for his father rather than in the family room relating with his father. And he has distanced himself from his brother with no concern for his well-being and health. He refuses to welcome him and to celebrate him. 
But notice the father's response. First, he tenderly treats this son, this older son, addressing him as a child in the Greek. He recognizes his faithfulness. He says, you are always with me. He reassures the son that the remaining inheritance is his. He says, and everything I have is yours. Yet the father maintains that it's right to celebrate this brother of yours. Now notice the contrast. As the older brother had called his brother this son of yours with disgust. And now the father emphasizes the brotherly relation. He says, this brother of yours. He says it with compassion. And he reminds him that the reason for this celebration is that he was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so Jesus leaves us with a sharp contrast between the love of the father and the jealousy of the older son. Well, no further explanation is given here, but none is really needed if we just meditate upon this parable in its context. See, the father symbolizes our heavenly father. The prodigal son in coming home represents the repentant sinner. And the older brother reflected the attitude of the self-righteous Pharisees and teachers of the law who are unwilling to welcome and seek those who are lost. You see, our Heavenly Father loves His children. Even when they turn away from Him, His heart yearns for them in love, especially when they return to Him with a repentant attitude. Now, Jesus has been repeating that there is joy in heaven, that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God, and it is right to celebrate and be glad when one sinner repents. Now the faithful children of God need to understand the proper way to receive the erring child who returns to God. Not with any sibling jealousy, but with a joyous celebration and a reaffirmation of love as illustrated by the father in the parable. And as Paul instructed the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8, now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Now, Jesus told this three-part parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the loving father to teach the important lessons to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And although they were directed toward them, imagine how these parables comforted the hearts of the tax collectors and the sinners who had drawn near to Jesus to hear him. Though considered unacceptable by the religious elite, they learned that they could be accepted by God. That God was seeking them and that he would lovingly receive them if they would repent. And if you realize how far you have fallen when you turned away from God, I pray that you would be moved to repentance by this parable. And may you never forget that your heavenly Father eagerly awaits your reconciliation with Him. So if you're ready to place your faith and trust in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the indwelling gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit who will witness 
with your spirit that you are a child of God and remind you of how much God loves you. Are you willing to make that decision today? If you have, God bless you. If you'll use the information down in the description below to get in contact with me, I would love to hear from you and talk with you about your decision and help you to follow up upon it. I pray that you would be reconciled with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'll have a good week and you'll have a good month as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. Pray that you'll have a good week and God bless. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our channel. And if you would like to watch other sermon videos, like this one, or if you would like to watch some devotional videos, please click one of the videos to the right. Have a blessed day.